Okay, let's assume that we have a trapezoidal approximation graph for y of x versus x, where this represents any function. Okay, now, if it's a smooth function, and I'm not going to define exactly what I mean by that. That's not something you want to leave for a rigorous calculus course, and I don't want to completely address that. Uh, I'm going to give you a background here. Okay, the accumulated area function, which I use the capital fancy, for which I use the capital fancy y of x, and the slope function y prime of x, those functions, I can say, exist. So, I can say these things exist for a reasonable function. Now, just because they exist doesn't mean we can write down a formula for them. Just because this function is smooth doesn't mean we can write down a formula for it. So we might or might not have rules that we can get from calculus that allow us to calculate this function or this function. Whether they can be calculated or not, though, if this function is well enough behaved and, and it's a fairly broad category of well-behaved functions, um, just because you can't write down a formula for it doesn't mean it ain't there. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Doesn't mean it doesn't model something important. Uh, we, if we don't have a formula for the function, chances are we're not going to be able to calculate the accumulated area function or the slope function as we did with the example of y equals x cubed plus 5 or with other examples that we've seen. Okay, so there's no reason to suppose that any of this stuff can be calculated or that any of these areas can actually be calculated. Still, we're going to be able to prove that uh, this function and this function have certain properties that are connected by what we call the fundamental theorem of calculus. <coughs> okay, so don't assume that we can calculate these. Don't assume we even have a formula for this. So we've got a graph. And I've got a trapezoidal approximation, attempted to draw a trapezoidal approximation. Uh, these lines stay fairly close to the curve, but there are some real discrepancies. Uh, still, we can say that the accumulated areas will be close to y of x, our accumulated area function. Uh, and the slopes will be close to the midpoint value of y prime of x at the chosen x values. That's the incremental x values. OK, and maybe I should use the word incremental there. I like that better. It just popped into my head. So we'll say incremental x values. and. I've indicated the incremental x values, these x values here. OK? Um, and the midpoint, y prime of x, of course, will be at the midpoints between the incremental x values. Now, let's consider what happens to the closeness of these approximations if we start having our increments. OK? If we have the increment, then we have new incremental x values here, 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 and here, in addition to our old incremental x values. So these are new incremental x values here, 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 and here. And now our trapezoidal approximation graph um, becomes as we've seen, approximately four times as accurate, depending on how nicely this function behaves and so forth. Uh, it's going to become more than twice as accurate and significantly more than twice as accurate, typically four times as accurate. So our new approximations, OK, if we have the increment, uh, of course, we get this graph here where our increments are, are, are approximating segments are much closer to the original graph, um, basically something like four times as close. Um, so our new approximations are about four times as close to the uh, values of our big fancy y of x and y prime of x, our accumulated area and slope function, at those incremental values. Uh, and our incremental values are now twice as close together. Okay, because 
our, the, we got new incremental values and we still have the old ones. So now we have incremental x values that are twice as close together. Okay, well, if we do this again, the same thing happens. Okay, we get incremental values twice as close together and incremental values uh, that divide each of these increments in half. And our new approximations again get four times as close together. So now our incremental values are four times as close together as they were at the beginning. But our approximations are four times four or 16 times as close together, uh, as, as close uh, at the incremental values. And now we've got twice as many incremental values, four times as many as we started with. Well, now let's say we continue this process. I've written a little bit more down here. Uh, how many halvings do we have? Well, if we did this once, then we've had one halving, and that corresponds to what we see here. And we originally started with four incremental values. Now, if you count the first one, uh, I probably shouldn't count the first one, okay, because we're going to have an incremental value for every increment. Uh, so at the end of the first increment, second increment, third increment, and fourth increment uh, of our original graph, uh, we have an accumulated area. And at the midpoint of our first, second, third, fourth increment, we have a value of y prime. OK, so uh, if we have once, then we go from 4 to 8. And that's what we see up here. And there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 incremental values. Uh, if we, and, and, and now we're four times as close, because every time we have the increment, we get four times as close to the actual values. So if we have the increment once more, so I can sketch that. And let me just kind of sketch that just uh, for reference. I won't do too many of those, but let's do this one. OK, so now we have have the preceding increment. I've used blue lines uh, for that. Uh, so we've done two halvings, and now there are 16 points, because every time we have the increment, we get twice as many points. So now there's 16 incremental values, 16 incremental values here, 16 points on the x-axis. And how much, what's the closeness of y and y prime? Well, relative to the original closeness, uh, it got four times as close the first time we have the increment. It's going to get four times closer than that, or 16 times as close with this halving. So uh, now we have 16 incremental values, and our approximations are 16 times as close. Well, if we continue that, yeah, you should pause and just try to finish this table. Three halvings, four halvings, and then let's go to 10 halvings. Just jump from four to 10, because hopefully you'll see a pattern if you do this. Well, OK, the pattern in the closeness of the incremental values is pretty clear. Uh, you're going to double that to get 32. You're going to double that to get 64. And if you keep doubling, um, and, and you should really be able to calculate these in your head, for 5, we're going to get twice 65. It's going to be 128. Doubling that for 6, then we have 256. Doubling that for 7, we have 512. Double that for 8, we get um, 1,024. Double that for 9, uh, we get 2,048. And double that for 10, we get 4,096. So after 10 doublings, we have 4,096 incremental values here. And obviously, I'm not going to draw them all. OK, what about the closeness? Well, every time you double uh, or have the increment, you get twice as many incremental values, you're going to get four times the closeness, which means you're going to get 64 times closer here. Uh, and four times that's 256 times closer here. By the time you get down here, uh, you're going to be, I think, 2 million approximately 2 million times closer. OK? And uh, we could figure that out. OK, another four times gets us to 1,024. Uh, uh, four times that is 4,096. Four times, and that would be for five, uh, and so forth. For six, it would be, uh, and I'm going to approximate that, it's going to be around 16,000 
uh, for seven is going to be 64,000. For eight is going to be 256,000. For nine is going to be about a million. For 10, it's going to be about 4 million. I said 2 million. That was a little bit of a bonehead thing. So that's about 4 million times closer. Okay? Now, what are the implications of this whole thing? Well, let's say we want to know what the value of y prime and big fancy y are here, our slope function, our accumulated area function. So that basically means we want to find the accumulated area from here to here and the slope at this point with a great deal of precision. Okay? Um, now, I'm going to skip a few of the details. Again, uh, when you prove this in calculus, you're going to use slightly different notation and different uh, breakdowns. But what you're going to essentially do is equivalent to what I'm doing here. So let's say that this point here corresponds to this green point, and this blue point here corresponds to this blue point here, and the red point is somewhere in between. Okay? And let's just assume that uh, that this red point is at an irrational number where these points are at rational numbers. And let's assume, and there's no reason to assume this, but let's assume it anyway, that these endpoints here are rational numbers. This is just an assumption for illustration. It's not an the assumption is not necessary. Um, but let's assume that x is irrational. Okay? Now, but what do we mean by rational and irrational? It means these can be expressed as integer divided by integer fractions. This one cannot. It means that these are represented by either terminating or repeating decimals. This one by a decimal which goes on forever, never terminates, but never repeats. And the implication of that is that if we keep cutting intervals in half, trying to isolate this point, as we're going to do in a minute, we will never actually land on this point. We can't have an interval between two rational points repeatedly and end up at an irrational point, because halfway between any two rational numbers is always a rational number. If this is an irrational number, we're never going to land on it. OK, well, let's see what happens now. We can subdivide our interval one time. Now we have twice as many incremental values and four times the accuracy in trying to determine y prime and big fancy y. And then we can cut this interval in half. And then we can cut this interval in half, and of course, we choose which half of the interval to focus on by which half this point is in. Okay, so this point is closer to here than here, so we'll cut it. Uh, we'll cut that interval in half, uh, and then we'll cut this interval in half, and we'll keep cutting the interval in half, and we're going to get a series of intervals that nest down onto this point but never actually reach it. As this process continues, our midpoint approximations on these smaller and smaller intervals get smaller, get closer and closer to the actual value of our y prime and big fancy y values, our slope function and the values of our slope function and our accumulated area function. And in fact, they get close very, very rapidly. So we can keep this up. This process can go on forever because we're never going to land on this point, but that doesn't really matter. And we're going to say, as the number of our halvings approaches infinity, that our approximating values of our y prime and big fancy y values, our slope and accumulated area functions, approach the actual values as limits. So whether we can calculate them or not, whether we have formulas that we can manipulate to actually see a formula for these functions, for each of these functions, doesn't matter 
These functions exist and they have values that can be defined by this sort of a process.